Uh, there might be a few more people. Strikers, OK. And, uh, but then many people expressed uh, a desire to hear your talk. OK. Uh, and it will be posted uh, online. Okay. Oh, wow. So it is uh, uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Tiffany Denon, who comes to us from the uh, University of uh, Michigan, uh, from uh, the mm -hmm. art school, where she also has a cross appointment in the School of uh, Public Health. And um, uh, Dr. Reno uh, has also given a PhD mini seminar on Friday, uh, on, uh, which was extremely interesting and uh, uh, intriguing for many of the students who attended and myself. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce you again. Uh, Dr. Reno's uh, research focuses on community health informatics. Specific themes in this research area include understanding uh, health information uh, acquisition sharing and use communities and families, appropriation, domestication of health information technologies with, uh, within communities and families, and investigating potential associations between health, psychosocial outcomes, and socio-technically medi uh, mediated health information. Her current research projects focus on the role of information in how family, families manage chronic illness, community health informatics interventions for HIV and STI prevention, with marginalized youth, uh, and uh, community health information infrastructures in urban communities. Uh, also understanding and enhancing peer-based information and support exchange among patients with kid kidney disease. She, she is widely published, uh, uh, recipient of many awards, and uh, overall a uh, wonderful scholar, so uh, let's uh, come to you. Thank you for the introduction. So thank you very much for having me here and very thank you as well to Maria for the invitation and uh, for the wonderful hosting. And it's really a pleasure to be here at Rutgers where so many uh, preeminent scholars, some of my heroes from the past are actually here. Um, actually heroes from the present too. Um, <laughs> so it's... Uh, <laughs> um, so it's uh, just it's kind of one of those rock star moments where it's kind of Awesome. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about how community matters, and I'm going to talk about um, a series of studies that look at the social dynamics of health information, behavior, and everyday life. And so I'm going to talk to you about sort of how I came to this work, a general overview of my research program, and some of the central findings from a few of the studies that I've done, and then I'll talk about some of the where places my work is going. So to kind of start um, with how I ended up doing this kind of work, initially um, after I did my master's degree in information, library information science at University of Toronto, I was starting to work in the nonprofit sector right away. And I was working in, um, initially in the area of violence prevention and then ultimately in the area of HIV treatment information. So it was primarily people who already had HIV. And one of the things that is characteristic of the disease of HIV is that HIV has tended to really concentrate in particular populations that were already sort of defined. And what this particular diagram shows you is that with regards to HIV, a group called um, men who have sex with men, but uh, you might also say gay and bisexual men, but this is, refers to a uh, behavioral group because of sort of dynamics of risk. But what this really shows you is that this particular population, since the beginning of the epidemic, has had a very disproportionate amount of HIV cases and a disproportionate amount of deaths related to the disease. And that particular disproportionate um, effect led to a lot of information activism, which some of you might be familiar with. So efforts to organize, um, this is an organization in Canada called AIDS Action Now, um, to try to find ways to get information out to people to really keep them alive because um, it was a time when there were no treatments available. Um, and this particular activism led to the formation of an organization that ultimately became the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange. And I went to work at this organization in 2004, and it was offering a number of services, some of which are depicted here. We had a very um, non-graphic dense website um, at the time. As well, we had a library, we had some consumer-oriented publications, and a treatment information um, counseling service. So this was intended to help people who were dealing with the disease get treatment information so that they could stay alive. 
Um, but one of the things that happened um, was around the time when I started working there, there started to be a real shift in the dynamics of the disease and HIV was sort of hitting new populations. And what we see in this diagram here is an increase in new infections amongst Aboriginal Canadians, um, what you would call that Native American here. Um, as well, there was an increase amongst um, African immigrants and other populations and a decrease in new infections um, overall in, in terms of overall proportion amongst um, MSM. And when I joined this organization, it was in a lot of struggle and strife because it really didn't know how the people working there to reach these new groups. It was actually um, a time when the organization started to experience a lot of financial strife. Um, they were getting a lot of complaints from stakeholders that they weren't meeting the needs of the different diverse groups. And um, it was a really hard time for the organization. And I became a part of different efforts to try to reach diverse populations there. But one of the things that really was an important struggle was that in trying to turn to the information science literature or my home discipline, I didn't see a lot that could really help us try to figure out how to serve these newer groups. And so um, I started to explore these ideas and I really found that you know, there's a really long history of there being certain groups of people that are not well served by libraries, the internet, whatever information service we might be thinking about. So I mean, even going back to 1949, um, libraries were reaching a minority of Americans. And today we still have 20% of people who don't use the internet at all. And typically it's the same demographic factors over and over again, which are associated with less use. There are things like socioeconomic status, race, disability, and geography. And in the public health area, in terms of health communication, there's also a lot of work to show that typically programs tend to be less effective for people who have low SES. So I became really sort of interested in this problem and started to look more into the issue of health disparities. And I found that you know, once I came to the United States, there were still significant health disparities associated with race around HIV in this, in this country. As you might see here, this is a diagram showing really disproportionate rates of HIV amongst African Americans and Latinos. We also see here that um, African Americans are also more likely to die and to die faster um, out of HIV as well. And what this shows, this is in Detroit, and which is an area that I do some work in, um, that because diseases tend to cluster disproportionately in different populations, it also means that because populations cluster geographically, diseases also cluster geographically. And so what we see here is a diagram showing that diabetes prevalence is much higher in the city of Detroit proper, versus, which is predominantly African American, versus some of the outlying areas which are suburban and predominantly white. And so I became very interested in this particular problem, um, the two problems of health disparities and how to reach these particular groups. And that's actually what drove me to go back and do my PhD, which I did at the University of Western Ontario. Um, and once I finished there, I moved to uh, UM School of Information. And so from there, I've really been working on a kind of sort of central research program that has a few elements that I'll just walk you through. So I've been interested in trying to understand um, information environments, which are at a mezzo level of social organization. So in the middle between, this is what we talked about on Friday, the middle in between individuals and the macro of societies, nation states, etc. So I'm interested in studying information environments and understanding their characteristics, understanding how these affect access to information and technologies, and the interplay between access and information behavior and technology use, as well sort of looking at community and family affiliation as a phenomenon and how they influence um, access and technology use. And then I'm also interested in some of the issues related to tracking and correlating information behavior with known mediators of health behavior. So we know that social support and social influence and social control in the health arena are really important areas in terms of looking at the emergence of health behaviors and psychosocial well-being. 
And interestingly, this is in these areas like health psychology and public health, there is some discussion of information. I was actually talking to Claire earlier today about some of the limitations of the ways that information is talked about in these fields. But trying to make these connections, so in a, in a way to increase our dialogue with these fields, and then to look at issues related to outcomes that are related to health behavior, um, psychosocial well-being and health, and always looking at dynamics of disparities in all of these. So this is really, these are the areas that I work in. And what I'm going to talk about today is really focusing on a sort of sub part of that work that asks the question about how community and family affiliation uh, matter for access to and use of health information. And there's a sort of sub question involved here, which is more practical, which really asks about what would information systems and services look like if marginalized populations were actually at the center of how we thought about designing them. So really here today I'm going to be focusing in on these boxes. Um, those are kind of parts of that central question. I'm sort of bracketing everything else that I do um, for today. So just to sort of ground us a little bit, the definition of community that I'm working with, you might be familiar with it as a very slippery term. It's used in a lot of different ways um, in our fields and also has quite a lot of baggage. But I'm really working with a Max Weberian um, understanding of community, which goes back to the 1920s, where he's talking about community as a kind of belonging. So the fe this feeling that you belong with somebody else. And I think of belonging as being established through a lot of different social processes. You might belong with somebody because you live near them. You might belong with somebody because you feel close to them. You might feel like you belong with them because you interact with them. Um, you might have belong with them because of shared meaning. So there's a lot of different ways that you could think about uh, belonging happening. But I really have, I'm working with a broad concept of um, community and so I'm actually interested in variations of kinds of communities and different ways that belonging is established. So my research program has looked at a, a lot of trying to vary very different populations that I study so different kinds of communities look at different health issues because different illnesses have different dynamics and then to also uh, work through community engaged research strategies. So because of my background in nonprofit organizations, I'm actually very comfortable with doing different kinds of community engagement, which involves things like community advisory committees, um, training community folks to get involved in research, things like that. So that's sort of how I do my work. And my sort of core point today is really that community connects information and health, and that by focusing on community, as a place of understanding and intervention, we have the opportunity to be able to uh, really more realize the potential between um, to use information to improve health. So I'm going to talk about these four studies now. So there's a few central findings I'm, I have that sort of underlie my assertion that community connects information and health. One is that Information environments do vary. I have work that has shown that and that it does affect access to information. Another is th some work that looks at some of the characteristics of what makes environments information rich for people in relation to health. Looking at different kinds of community involvement factors and how they might relate to information behaviors. And also I'm asserting that trust in information and technologies has a collective basis. So these are my core assertions today. And each of my studies addresses one of these assertions. <laughs> okay, so the first study I was gonna talk about, um, Maria has heard a lot about this study. Um, this was um, the Rural HIV Information Network Study. It took place in Canada. And the unit of analysis here is information environments. And the research questions focused on whether there were regional differences in HIV information environments, and also what kinds of questions people could answer or not in their local regions. Can yes. I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, when you talk about information environments, mm -hmm. is there some relationship to, let's say, Taylor's ideas or 
What do we, it's, do we mean? It's Leah Leavers, and I'll, I'll be showing you the model oh, in a moment. Sure. Okay, yeah. So let's, um, so I'm focusing on this part of the research program. And so the, so the regional focus, this is just a map. It shows you that the places we were working were rural Newfoundland, um, southwestern Ontario, and the interior of BC. And this is the definition in answer to <laughs> Nick's question. Um, so working with Leah Lever's definition from her 2001 piece, um, which talks about resources, relations, and technologies um, in a particular environment. And information environments as a social milieu. Yes? <coughs> I trip over this definition. Mm -hmm. It says an information is a place where something called informing happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, that seems to just pass it off to a word that I don't know at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Informing? Yeah. Okay. I will show you the model. So it's a bit of a, I mean, I know the definition might appear a bit tautological, but I'll show you the model. This is the model. And so basically... It is tautological. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so... This is the information environments model. And basically, what she, there are a couple of underlying um, assertions in this model. One is that environments vary. So these, these characteristics of environments vary between each other. And the other is that these, char these environmental characteristics predict at the center um, what, she, what she calls capacity. Um, and I've talked about it as enacted capacity or ability to get your questions answered. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, we have what she calls the institutional aspect. And I've actually modified her model to make it more, because um, it's, it's a very general model. I'm working with it in a particular context. And so I talk about mediating institutions. In an HIV context, the um, health, health institutions are the most important. I also talk about um, social participation and information, which are th factors she talks about. And together, those make up the institutional aspect in her model. The aspects of institutions that I'm interested in are the kinds of services they offer. So what are their models? Um, how many, what they have in terms of available resources? And then how they're using technology to serve their clients. Then on the right hand side, we have the personal and relational aspect in gray. And so she talks about information networks as facilitating access to information. And here I'm looking at specific characteristics of networks, like the number of ties between people with HIV, also the who's, who's a central actor, how cohesive is the network, et cetera. And then she also talks about interpersonal interaction and knowledge. And what ba she basically suggests is that these two aspects of an environment coalesce or to create certain situational um, and personal factors that lead to an active capacity. Did you have a question, Ross? No, no, no. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's a complicated model. So basically, this is a mixed method study. I did interviews with 117 people with HIV, as well as their family members and service, pro service providers and healthcare providers. We also did a telephone survey with a random sample of the population and some document um, analysis. And this sort of gives you an idea of the methods used. I can talk more about any of the methods, but I'm gonna, I think you'll probably be more interested in finding, so I'm gonna skip to those more. So in terms of the question of regional differences, so basically, what you see here is a summary of the institutional service models um, and the internet use and clinical um, and their, their service models, how much they had in the way of resources and how they were using technology. The key point here is that in any way that the institutions could vary, they varied. Okay. So they, we saw different service models. We saw different amounts of staff per person with HIV. We saw different levels of internet use with patients, et cetera. So in each of these three regions, there was variation. 
Also, in looking at social participation, I was looking at how relevant people thought HIV was to their community, as well as their attitudes towards the disease, um, and found that there were significant differences in all cases between the regions. In terms of information availability, we saw that there was variation in the extent to which people were using the internet to find HIV information, significant differences. Also, people were more likely to think that different sources were available to help them in different regions. So the only thing that were not varying on a regional basis was basically the extent to which people were exposed to HIV information through mass media. Okay, which makes sense because mass media isn't local. So um, then we have information network characteristics. And basically, the key point here again is that in any way that a network could vary, there was variation. What are PHAs again? Person with HIV or AIDS. <coughs> and then looking at, now we're looking at the personal aspect. And or rela relational aspect. And here we see, <coughs> again, there are significant regional differences in the amount that people are talking about HIV and the amount they're looking in their social networks for information about HIV. The only thing that's not differing is the level of knowledge that they had about the disease. Basically, the knowledge level was about a C plus. Um, and interestingly, about one in five people thought that HIV could be transmitted through casual contact. Yes, Paul. Um, I'm going to ask a kind of detailed question about the amount or level at which people are talking about it. <coughs> yeah. uh, because we know <coughs> from library studies that different communities may give very different real world meaning to the same words on mm -hmm. a different scale. Yeah. So how, how actually did you find out how much they were talking about? This was actually based on a binary variable, which was have you ever talked to any other person about HIV? And so it's just the fraction you yeah. said that they have ever yeah. talked yeah. about yeah. it. Yes. And so what we see here is the proportion of people who say they have. Are there differences in the proportion? Oh, these are people who are HIV positive? This is the general population. Oh, general population. This is the population survey results. Okay. Yeah. So basically what we're seeing here is that 63% um, of people in the BC region had ever talked to somebody, but it was as low as 42% in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. But there was no difference in general media discussion about that? In, in popular media? Yeah. Um, no. Is there a difference in the fraction of the population who are Um in terms, so overall prevalence numbers are really tough to get for rural areas, but these areas were roughly serving the same proportions of people with HIV, which was between about 30 and 75 people. And they were all, um, so it would be a very small prevalence, be low prevalence. Okay. Okay. So then I looked at the question of information acquisition success. So it was a content analysis of all the questions that they'd had, that they talked about in the last five years in their related to HIV. And the question, these were questions they tried to answer locally. One thing was that the majority, uh, they did pretty well. Um, over 85% of questions were ones that they could answer. Um, we used a measure of answering that based on, it was based on their subjective per perception that it was answered. Um, although there were a few cases where I overrode that because they were believing in absolute misinformation. <laughs> um, so I considered those ones not answered. Um, so I did a, a, an ANOVA to look at whether there was a regional difference as well as whether it was different based on whether they were lay people or professionals, and basically found that there were no regional differences in how much people were getting their questions answered. It was actually only whether they were lay or professional that mattered. So basically, the summary here is that almost every way that an environment could vary, it did. Most aspects of the institutions, most aspects of work and of interpersonal interaction varied. The only things that didn't vary were knowledge levels, which you could probably think might be more individually based. Um, 
mass media exposure, and how much people were getting their questions answered. So in general, there's pretty broad support for Leah Leverou's idea here that information environments vary. Then we looked at um, the, the kinds of questions people were able to answer. So I analyzed um, the question type and their success and basically found that there were some real regional patterns with regards to how much people could answer their questions. So for example, BC residents um, could had a lot more trouble answering questions related to treatment than people who were in other areas. And in Ontario, there were um, people had more trouble answering questions related to transmission and prevention than in other areas. And interestingly, these actually correlated with some of the institutional aspects of the environment. So they had less resources accorded to healthcare in BC, for example, than other areas. So basically, I did an analysis of the barriers and basically found that the most common variation was an individual difference. So people, information and health literacy was the number one reason why people couldn't get a question answered. So the source was too complex, they didn't know what they were being told, that kind of thing. But then there were also systemic aspects of the environments that were varying too. And so there were certain characteristics in each area that were variable. In BC, we saw that a big problem was lack of local resources. So physicians that wouldn't take on people with HIV, these are quotes from um, people who were interviews with people in the area. Also, um, public health unit, they didn't necessarily replace people who left, who couldn't do, um, who, who were doing HIV testing. So basically they couldn't refer people to services because they weren't available. And here, there was difficulty um, in Newfoundland with regards to healthcare providers who didn't know about HIV, but not only did they not know about it, but they actually asked the patients to inform them about the disease. So I don't actually think there are other diseases where that would happen very much. So I think it's a, an attitudinal thing there. And then here in Ontario, it was the problem with aid <laughs> service organizations that basically didn't really respond to calls because they were completely run by volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically here we um, had a, another kind of a problem which had to do with aid service organizations. So based on that particular analysis of um, barriers, I'm <coughs> suggesting an extension to the model which is the idea of institutional capacity, which includes ideas like responsiveness of services, the knowledge of care providers, um, the availability of services, etc as a mediating factor between institutions and enacted capacity. So basically, my claim here, information environments do vary in most ways um, based on this particular study, and I'm suggesting that um, we should extend the model to include institutional capacity. So now I'm gonna talk about the eKidney project. So this is studies done in dialysis clinics. And here I'm using more of Chapman's ideas of information world. Um, and I'm looking at the characteristics of dialysis clinic environments. And this would be the part that I'm talking about in my overall model. So I use Chapman's theory of life in the round here. I'm going to make the assumption that most of you know this theory. Um, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail. Basically, the study was looking at whether these characteristics were present in the environment. And one of the sort of insights I had about this particular theory is that really life in the round is about an information rich environment. I mean, it's a place where people could, could obtain information that they needed. And so I'm sort of looking at her particular model in that context as well as extensions. So this was ethnographic observation in three dialysis clinics as well as interviews um, with patients and thematic coding. Just to give you an idea of what a clinic looks like, how, how many of you have ever been in a dialysis clinic? Nobody, okay. So basically people sit in these reclining chairs and they sit there for four hours and they're completely bled out and then all their blood is put back in. It's very uncomfortable. This is what the artificial kidney looks like. That is blood going through all the um, tubes. It's not a very pleasant experience. And that's certainly what we heard from people. It's a very unpleasant physically kind of experience. These are some of the things that they describe in that experience. 
And it's a very constraining thing. They need to go three times a week in order to replace their kidney function, and they often feel really drained afterwards. But one of the things about the sort of information world of this environment is despite how hard it was to be on dialysis, people remained committed to treatment. And it really, it seemed that the world was oriented around one fundamental issue, which was the idea of how to make dialysis tolerable. And we, it really seemed like information was helping people try to find a way to go on. So basically this environment was really, we saw characteris characteristics of Chapman's theory where people were gradually learning to live on dialysis through various characteristics of the environment like immersion in an information rich environment, repetition of routines, trial and experience, and learning to correlate your own experience with uh, different kinds of measures. Um, they also obtained information through examples and imitation of others um, and gradual informing about how to handle lifestyle restrictions. One of the sort of key concepts that emerged in this environment is the idea of experiential information. And that is something that Chapman talks about, but not in a lot of depth. And this relates to people's practical strategies for learning how to live on dialysis. Um, and these are some of the things that they were swapping ideas with, how to be comfortable, because I mean, it is a four hour process. Um, they talked about care at different clinics. Um, one story that sort of went around with a lot of people was the idea that somewhere there was actually a clinic where you could go and sit and they would actually have a massager in the chair. Nobody had ever seen this, but it was like this wonderful idea that they all hoped for. <laughs> yes. Um, so it was kind of like a story that people drew comfort from. And there were a lot of practical strategies that they talked about, like how to follow really intense guidelines for food and medication. That's a really, really restrictive thing. So here somebody is talking about um, trying to find ways to get enough protein. Um, somebody else here is trying to find a way not to have their blood pressure crash in the middle of a session, um, et cetera. The other part of experiential information that was important is the personal story. So people talked about, um, for example, patients who got kidney transplants, they were incredibly inspiring. They were people that they looked up to, that they had hope for, because many people were on lists themselves to get a transplant. But they also were able to draw negative examples from other people too, which was people who died, who weren't doing really well, who had a lot of symptoms. And those formed, um, acted as sort of negative examples. And the idea of experiential information sharing, it was really driven through one-to-one -one conversation. People learn through informal observation, through ongoing contact, um, and they, but there were a lot of barriers um, to interaction in that environment. I mean, there's the space between people, the machines are loud, people don't necessarily feel well, et cetera. Um, so we saw characteristics of a worldview formation in line with Chapman as well, um, which really was oriented to trying to make the best of things. And the other sort of idea that comes up in Chapman, but that, I th that became stronger in this study than I think in her own, is the idea of routines. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working with the concept of, um, of organizational routines, collective routines, that comes out of the organizational studies literature. And it was really a characteristic of this environment that there was a lot of information provision embedded in routines that people followed. Um, progress updates, intake, monthly labs, things like that. And there were also kind of almost like in Goffman terms, like ritualized interactions between people um, where they were their daily greetings, sitting together while they waited for treatment, things like that. And what all this sort of gave us was a sense that the people really trusted that information was already there. It was an, a really an environment where people didn't need to actively seek a lot of information because they could count on it coming to them as they needed it and they could engage with it in all kinds of ways. So based on an analysis of these clinics and extension of Chapman's theory, I'm suggesting that there are certain features that make an environment information rich with regards to health. One of them is the idea of shared experience and challenge. 
and have bringing, finding ways to bring people together who have that shared experience. The idea of ambience, so having available information around you that you can choose to interact with when you're ready, as you want to, etc. The idea of routinization as a way of imparting information rather than as a way of not needing information, which is how it often is dealt with in organizational studies. Um, also, I sort of extend the idea of Chapman's study, which was really based on a prison, so it was very firm boundaries, like you couldn't leave. And here, um, my, what I'm suggesting here is that um, boundaries can be permeable, but you can still have an information-rich information world that's kind of more, um, more uh, bounded for people. Also, uh, one of the, the findings here was that um, there were problems with aggregation of experiential information. So people were mostly talking to each other one-on-one, -on -one, and so they weren't really able to swap ideas beyond their small group. And so one of the areas that I'm working on here is the idea of peer mentoring in terms of follow-up work to try to find ways of aggregating information more. Tiffany, does that yep. your kind of conceptual definition of what community is? Um, for belonging or for peers? For peers. Oh, for prolonging. For, you know, if they're just one-on-one, -on -one basically, mm -hmm. So that's part of what I am working on in terms of next steps with peer mentoring, yeah. trying to find ways of aggregating community. Here, though, the, bound, the sort of idea of the community is sort of established institutionally by the, the organization of care. So that's sort of how the belonging is. People gain a recognition of this is you know, somebody else who's at my clinic kind of thing. So th it's almost like substituting one form of belonging for another is the kind of intervention that I'm looking at. All right, so the next study was focused on young men who are at risk for HIV. I was talking to this paper, uh, talking to Paul about this paper on Friday. So this is looking at um, young men who have sex with men. So basically, people who have sex with other men could be gay or bisexual, or they may not identify as such, as such and they might, um, but they could still be at risk for HIV. That's the concept of MSM, but also, there's a lot of variation in how much people get involved in the gay community. And the sort of basic idea behind this study was that because of that first slide I showed you around HIV being much more um, a part of the gay community over many years, that there could be some kind of um, effects with regards to being more involved in the community in terms of access to information. And that was the basic idea here. So what we see here, so this paper was just published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research, and this is a model, um, this is a structure, structural equation model for those of you familiar with that. And here I was looking at survey responses, and I was looking at how much people were looking for information, how much people were acquiring information incidentally. So that's um, concepts that have, have had, had some more recent life in our field as well how much people were using information related to HIV. And I looked then at certain uh, community-oriented variables to see how, what the kinds of correlations they had. So I looked at a measure of gay community involvement um, drawn from some work in Australia. And then I looked at some of the variables that have some history in our field, um, social costs of information seeking, which is more of a Chapman idea, her theory of information poverty. I also looked at the idea of network expertise access, and that's about having people in your social network who know something about HIV and you can talk to them about it. And then how much you think that HIV is relevant to your group. So those are the variables I'm looking at here. So again, looking at my model, this is the section I'm studying. It was a web survey with 194 young men um, between the ages of 18 and 24. Also, we had interviews uh, with people with high gay community involvement. Just to give you an idea of the measure, um, we were asking questions like, how many of your friends are also men who have sex with men? Do you feel you're a part of the gay community in your area, etc." So we had a five item scale. Um, in terms of who was in the study, the mean age was around 20, and it was majority <coughs> African American. And based on the age, as you might expect, um, a 
it was actually a small proportion who had finished college. And the majority identified as gay, but we also had some folks who identified as bisexual or heterosexual. So now I'm going to show you a series of regressions that look at relationships between variables. Um, and here what we see is that gay community involvement is actually not related to any demographic factors. It's not related to age, it's not related to minority status, it's not related to education. But we see here that there is a significant relationship between gay community involvement and how much you think that um, people will think badly of you if you look for information about HIV, so social costs of information seeking. And as you can see, it's a negative relationship, so the more involved you are in the gay community, the less stigma you perceive around that. Then we see, looking at how much, how likely it is for you to have um, expertise accessible in your social network related to HIV. Again, um, all these demographic factors do not make a difference, but community involvement was the only significant factor. Then looking at community relevance. So this is about you thinking that the disease is relevant to your group. Again, all these other variables not relevant, but gay community involvement was. For incidental information acquisition, again, community involvement was a significant um, variable. The others were not, um, except for education. And that's primarily because uh, people often get classes that deal with health in their education. For information seeking frequency, there was a relationship with race. Um, people who are African American or Latino were looking for information more often. Um, but uh, gay community involvement was again uh, relevant here. Then looking at information use for decision making, um, again, community related va variables were relevant. Community relevance was important, as well as issues related to getting access to that information. And 28% of the variance in information use was predicted by these variables. One of the things I think is pretty interesting is that for community relevance, um, it was actually more important than incidental information acquisition. So if you think the information is relevant to your group, you're more likely to use it than if you have it, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> so this is a path analysis here that basically looks at simultaneously all of these variables. And um, the demographic variables dropped out because they didn't improve the model at all. And it, interestingly, com gay community involvement, actually, once we took into account community relevance and these other variables it was connected with, it was now only an indirect effect. So it's having its complete effect through community relevance, network expertise access, and social costs, as well as these information acquisition variables. So this model, um, what we see here is the testing of the model. Um, this basically says that the model had good fit. So, but overall it had a good fit, but it's still a fairly small proportion of overall variance explained. 30%, it's, you know, it's better than, not, it's, it's actually, it's pretty good, but it's, there's a lot more that isn't explained. So, also did some qualitative analysis of interviews with people who had high community involvement. And here, the variable of information sharing emerged as a critical theme. And we found that people really thought of community as a kind of enactment of pro-social community values, looking out for each other, um, working together, trying to make a difference in levels of the disease in your community. And for some people, informing others was actually the definition of community. So, and people were involved in a number of forms of information sharing. These are some of them. They organized events for each other. They encouraged safety amongst their friends. Um, they referred and recommended people to helpful sources, et cetera. Um, and in terms of consequences, it seemed that there would be a relationship between information sharing and these other um, forms of information behavior that were in the model. Um, one thing that I thought was most interesting is that in terms of information use, is that people took on the idea that if they were informing others about HIV, they'd better be a good role model themselves. And so they were changing their behavior in order to try to accommodate um, 
their information sharing behavior. So the discussion here, basically my assertions are community involvement does affect how much people look for information about HIV, how much they get it uh, without looking for it, how much they use it, and um, thematically it would suggest that information sharing is relevant. In, in terms of theoretical mediators, these variables that were included in the model, social costs, network, network expertise accessibility, and community relevance are all potential areas for intervention in terms of supporting people in using information more. So the last study I was going to talk about is the HOPE project. And this focuses on HIV amongst young African Americans. And this project started to try to inform online HIV and STI prevention. Basically, we asked, we had a series of focus groups where we asked people what they wanted to see in an intervention. And we didn't expect it, but the findings were almost everything they talked about had to do with trust. So that it wasn't what we initially thought about, but this was the central theme in everything they talked about. So again, this is this particular area of the research program. And based on the fact that they were talking so much about trust, I started to read more about the sociology of trust. And this particular field suggests that trust has a collective basis. That basically there are patterns of trust that we have that are linked to culture. And that different kinds of trust carry over between different social levels. So if we trust institutions, it will carry over to the technologies they produce. If we trust specific groups or don't, it will carry over to individuals. So the idea here is one of carryover. Also, the theory talks about secondary targets like trust and information as something that's collectively determined. And also they talk about social contexts as being critical for the ability to trust, that we actually become able to trust others because of social accountability built in the environment. Like the idea that we know we're going to see somebody again in the future, so we're not going to mess with them now. Or, we, or other people, we know people in common and it will ruin our reputation if we or nasty to somebody. So here it was a study in a Midwestern state. Um, we looked in a city that was over half African American, very poverty dense. Um, and it's an area with a lot of HIV and STIs. In fact, it's one of the areas in the country that has one of, as in the last few years, had one of the only active syphilis epidemics. So most people think of that disease as being gone, not here. So we did interviews um, with 75 African-American young people. And the average age was around 18. Um, it was th almost 3 quarters women. Um, and we had one group that was specifically for LGBT young people. So that's why we have that number there. As you might expect with this age of people, um, most of them had less than a high school education. So we found that there, was, there were a lot of intervention-relevant trust concerns. So in terms of the idea of personal trust, we saw a really strong articulation of the idea of uh, moral failings in their community leading to, in their theories, um, higher rates of these, these diseases. And they really saw people as not being trustworthy because they didn't care about themselves or others. They didn't um, necessarily um, behave in an honest fashion, they weren't necessarily faithful, and they might be looking for revenge um, and deliberately spreading the disease accordingly. Did those people think that everyone who was infected was untrustworthy? Um, I would say that there were some individuals who perhaps knew somebody who was positive that weren't like that, but or didn't hold those views, but I would say that the idea of the AIDS bad guy was very prominent. Among a community of people who, by this reasoning, were all bad guys. Um, these, so or, do they, or, or is it that almost everyone regards himself as an innocent victim of a bad guy? So these were not HIV positive people that oh. we were talking to. Mm -hmm. So these were young African Americans who were um, at risk because they're potentially they're in a high prevalence yeah. community. 
um, and they're part of the demographic that is at risk, but they are not positive. Sorry. It's okay, no problem. Rather clarify than not. <laughs> um, so another thing that was clear in their sort of theories of illness was that really they did see their environment as not supporting trustworthy behavior. They saw families as being unstable. They saw um, a community where people were very much in, um, disinvested locally. They were moving away. They didn't care. And so they really thought that this problem was linked to their environment. And there was a lot of distrust of institutions in this group. Um, as you, some of you might know if you've ever done research with African Americans, I mean, there was a lot of distrust of the government, in particular CDC, um, which was interesting because our project was funded by the CDC. Um, but basically they were very concerned about whether it, the CDC was doing enough about the disease. They had some bad experiences with healthcare providers um, who were possibly stereotyping them or not answering um, their questions. They had teachers who gossiped about them. They had, um, many of them found their churches to be supportive, but often there were people at the churches who were not um, and were negative about sexuality. One group that seemed to be positive um, for them were community-based organizations like Planned Parenthood. Also, there was a lot of distrust in terms of technologies, um, particularly social media. They certainly saw that there could be problems with um, acquiring information from others, but they also were afraid of things like technology-facilitated privacy breaches. Um, one of the things that I didn't know before talking to this group was that often people don't retain control over their own cell phones. So other people might have their cell phone, and if they were to get a push message related to HIV or STIs, they were very concerned about that. And there was a lot of negative interactions on the internet. A lot of fighting, a lot of gossip, a lot of it had to do with allegations of infidelity. Um, that those were the media by which rumors about people supposedly deliberately spreading HIV were being circulated. And they were also, interestingly, quite, um, not quite unsure of their trust in condoms and HIV tests. And this seems to be linked to the history of abstinence only until marriage sex education um, that these young people had because they actually were having schooling that was teaching them that um, condoms were unreliable or emphasized failures more than successes. So as a result, um, there were some people who were okay. They thought condoms were, um, were reliable. They're there for you, you should use them. But as this person's quote says, um, not a, there was definite counter messaging happening for them. Also, people seem to be very confused about the idea of a window period for HIV tests. They didn't really understand how long an HIV test would be accurate, and if so, if it, and also whether they could count on the results themselves. How long or how soon? Um, it's actually both. So it was both the question of, oh, they might have had a negative test today, but what have they done after? And then there was also, the issue of not understanding the window period of how soon it would be accurate. So basically the whole issue of timing around HIV tests freaked people out. Okay, um, in terms of trust and information, um, there was also, I mean, what we saw was people were not necessarily trusting authoritative information coming from institutions. And as a result, there was a lot more reliance on reputation and rumor as a result. And people really thought that the way to protect themselves was to know who to avoid. Um, which makes sense if they're not necessarily trusting in technologies that could help them, like condoms. So basically, they were trying to avoid people who they thought were HIV positive or apartment complexes where there were high rates of HIV and STIs. It was basically trying to stay away from people. But at the same time, there was also concern about reputation um, and rumor as potentially being unreliable. So there was, but there was a lot of that kind of local production of information again, where people were trying to meet their needs for safety. So the conclusion here, I'm making the claim that trust has a collective basis. Um, and what we saw here in this particular case was the idea of a system of meaning. Um, there was, trust was attached to almost anything that could potentially affect an intervention.
um, which surprised us but was incredibly informative uh, for what we wanted to do. There also seemed to be this phenomenon of carryover of trust between institutions and people and technologies. Um, and that as a result, we were thinking about certain strategies for intervention and work that would include things like um, connecting any online intervention to an offline world, looking at ways of trying to allow people who are um, trying to, who are very motivated to reduce HIV and STI rates in their community, give them ways to give references, um, to give references for positive behavior or communicate positive norms um, online, as well to give people tools for po collective action around the disease and for group monitoring. So concluding remarks. So I hope I have persuaded you today that community connects information and health. I've suggested to you through the study of rural HIV networks that information environments vary um, and that, that, that access to information also can vary uh, within communities, especially the barriers people encounter. I've shown you some of the characteristics of an information rich environment. There we were talking about dialysis clinics, things like ambience, routines, um, the ability of people with shared challenges to be connected, et cetera. I've shown you a model that shows that community involvement matters um, quantitatively with regards to using information as well as acquiring it. And I've shown you that trust um, can be collective in nature um, and be associated with um, information, health information and technologies. So uh, part of what I've been doing is trying to develop a theoretical basis for what I'm calling community health informatics as a form of practice. And some of this would involve building information rich environments. And through my work, I've suggested some areas where one could intervene to try to create information rich environments. Things like informing routines, um, affecting ambience, things like that. I've also suggested a few theoretical mediators um, for intervention. Um, some of these are drawn from our, work, our literature broadly, but I think my work is unique in showing how much things matter. They haven't typically been studied quantitatively. And I've also forwarded an idea called trust-centered design. And this is in a JAMIA paper, Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association, that's uh, just coming out. Um, it's available online, but it isn't in print yet. And this is a model for what I'm calling trust-centered design that really looks at ways of um, taking into account institutional, technological, group, and personal trust in our particular context. But more broadly, I'm suggesting that there needs to be sort of central consideration of trust factors in every aspect of design. So my future work, I'm looking at more some more information environments and trying to look at their characteristics. And I'm also doing more of that work in other parts of that uh, model. So I'm now moving more to what's in green um, and this box here, looking at um, social support and social control. Green and gold. And gold, yes. <laughs> okay, and I have some ongoing projects that are looking at some of these issues. One of the things that's nice about working a lot with healthcare providers and public health folks is that it facilitates often gathering information about health outcomes and health behavior. And so I have some projects where I'm gathering those kinds of data together and we'll be looking at some ongoing correlations. And I'm also looking at uh, my two intervention studies. Uh, the one that focused on trust, that particular study, we're actually, it's a five-year intervention and we're just getting our results now. Um, so that will be interesting. So now I will conclude to say, I told you why I'm interested in what I'm interested in. Um, and my focus on marginalized communities and trying to think about how to, what information systems and services would look like if marginalized groups were at the center. I've shown you my overall research program. I've talked about four studies that have led me to specific assertions about um, the ways that community connects information and health um, and talked about my future work. And I would like to acknowledge funding um, from multiple sources. 
um, as well as multiple collaborators. Thank you. Some questions, uh, and we should continue questions at lunch as well. There's a lunch group. Up. Great, thanks. I think you had your hand up first, Paul. Very, very quick reflexes there. Um, uh, some of us are thinking about the question of um, how a community who have to discuss something among themselves and don't want it to be generally known um, might collectively and in a distributed way monitor access to their community. Uh, and I was interested that you, uh, in, in the work on men who have sex with men, mm -hmm. you found so many negative connotations to the social media framework. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you see any possibility there for the development of something that might enable a kind of community trust building mechanism mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. it could become effective? Yes, so in terms of the, so the HOPE project, the ones, one that I talked about in Trust, that's actually in Flint, I can tell you that in this. Um, so that in, that f in the Flint study, there we're, we're making some suggestions about using technology to try to create a trustworthy environment. So there are a few things to do that, that we have put forward. One is the idea of promoting group accountability, partly through people being able to voluntarily make commitments about their behavior or their actions or intentions online, and to sort of see their online community as an accountability mechanism. Do you mean their behavior online or that the commitment is made online? The commitment's made online. Uh, okay. Yes. Really, yep. We want to carry it over to mm -hmm. their behavior. Online. Yeah, yeah. So another piece around that is also couples. So sometimes couples wanted to be online together and to be allow couples to share how they negotiate trust and things like that. And um, one of the things that's kind of interesting with uh, this population is it's actually pretty common for couples to disagree about whether they have agreements about uh, monogamy. And so if because of that, to actually... <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. So basically to have an online setting where people, it's almost like gives them an opportunity to clarify and state publicly what they have agreed to. Um, so that's another piece. <laughs> yes. Um, but, hope, but the idea of doing it together is that you might create a process by which they could have some kind of shared understanding. Um, also, the idea of people talked a lot about norms being problematic and so looking at trying to have generalizations of recommender systems or reputation systems where people are recommending behaviors that are positive and of course it could go the other way. So part of why you need, uh, one of the good things about our, our intervention has, is that it has an offline social network component. So we have people who are really eager to do something and so they could get involved and help to pr produce po representation of positive norms online. Um, and then also people talking about their experiences with certain behaviors like, oh, a condom actually worked for me, <laughs> to sort of counter these, this particular kind of negative messaging. So those are a few of the things. Another piece is around the reputation and credible information. I mean, how you position the intervention, with is it's really important to align with institutions that people already trust um, or that have good relations in a community. So um, I think that's one of the sort of insights that I suggest in that paper too. Nick. Um, in the first study that you talked about, um, it seems to me that uh, it, it's, uh, it seems to me that the model would, uh, uh, that Leo's model would predict um, that if there are differences uh, in the uh, information environment, uh, there will be differences in that uh, thing in the middle. Capacity. Right, yeah. but there weren't any differences in that thing in the middle, right? It was, it was, it was in, in the, the rate. Of, uh, they all got the same level of answer. Um, they all had the same, r within the same range of success rates. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. So what's going on? Um, well, one of the things is that the, the individual is still important. So I'm not suggesting that community is the only factor. But when we look at the fact that 30% of the problems people had were related to health literacy, that's the same across regions. So I would say that you know wherever you're working, health literacy 
is probably going to be an issue. So that's one thing. Another thing is that there were still barriers in every environment, and I think part of it is the issue that it's rural. So in rural areas, you're often dealing with low, low prevalence and not a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that the nature of the problems people encountered were different. So they were leading, they had the overall rates of mm -hmm. having um, similar rates, but that there may be something about morality and, or maybe even just resource poor settings that sort of lead to systemic problems mm -hmm. um, that are not necessarily about specifically the, where, the which rural. That make sense? Yeah, possible. <laughs> I'm saying that it's wrong. I'm trying. Pardon? <laughs> I had another question. Okay, yeah. Did, but were you following up on the same question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had, a, I had another question, mm -hmm. uh, actually, on the young men's study. Mm -hmm. um, you said you took out all of the demographic factors. Mm -hmm. But um, the one that struck me mo uh, most was, uh, uh, let's see, um, uh, African American, Hispanic, uh, info men seeking. were uh, uh, engaged in much more information seeking. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, that's, uh, that was a demographic factor that mm -hmm. seems pretty important, right? So when it was put into the model, it only accounted for a 2% difference in the overall variance in the yeah. dependent variables. So that was, um, it yeah. was removed because it didn't improve overall prediction. How much of the overall dependent variable could you account for? What, based on race? So I'll go back to it. To say this is why uh, this might help me understand my skepticism about these sorts of models. Because okay. The, uh, okay. okay, so here, so this number here is the proportion of variance explained. So here, it's 28% of the variance in um, information use, but as we see here, it's 9% oh, no, of the variance. Is oh, I see. Explained. Yes. So. And here, it's 14% of the variance. And so when race was in here, we were, improve, we were pr predicting 16%, not 14. So it didn't make enough of a difference to include it in the model. And these model fit numbers were kind of thrown off by including it too. So I mean, if we think about it, if we just think about the data as opposed to the model, mm -hmm. that's pr it seems to me a pretty interesting result that was worth mm -hmm. So, right? so it, I mean, it was part of what was investigated in the sense, I mean, obviously right. I've reported it here. Um, I mean, in that particular group, it was also a group where there's higher levels of HIV, right? So the Af African American MSM have the highest burden of all. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that there's a component there that's being explained by, by the prevalence. Um, but again, but, you know, again, it was like, I'll go back to that number here. Yeah, yeah, the groups are very different in one or more other variables. Yeah. 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 It's confounded. So, so it's a, it is more um, significant here, um, but as you can might be able to sort of see by the difference in the adjusted B, it's it's not a huge difference okay. there. Yeah. And. There's also overlap here between the two yeah. groups. Yeah. Okay. Have I convinced you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sort of. Okay. <laughs> Claire. May I have a question about your trust-centered design? Yep. Uh, do you see that as influencing or informing uh, health promotion campaigns or Sorry, people go back who to wish it. to disseminate information about some kind of uh, prevention, or, or, went. or is it just theoretical and you don't see it as uh, influencing anything pragmatic in the area? Oh, it's, it's in t specifically intended to be pragmatic. It's intended to be a tool for people who are trying to develop informatics interventions to work with African Americans in particular, 
but really any group where you need to intentionally cultivate trust. So it could be any group that has a systematic reason to distrust institutions and authority or things like that. Um, and we're, we're using that framework in our own intervention. So that HOPE project is actually um, a quasi-experiment where we have um, a face-to-face -face social network intervention in two communities, and then in one community, there's also an online component. Maria. Do, do you see that coming out of the health informatics or you know, theoretical contributions in other areas of trust? Just, uh, do I see it coming out of health informatics? Uh, you know, um, health informatics is uh, and your uh, areas of application mm -hmm. is very logical. But mm -hmm. your theoretical findings might be mm -hmm. interesting outside of mm -hmm. that area mm -hmm. of application. Mm -hmm. um, it could be. I, I think that, you know, the idea of soci you know, socio the sociolo sociology of trust could be used in a lot of different areas, I would say. Um, and the sort of rings that you see, um, as well as the sort of frame, I, I wish I could get this to come back up, but for some reason I can't. Um, but that particular model, I think, or structure could be used, but probably some of the contents would change depending on the context. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, your um, concentric uh, circles. Mm -hmm. We're just in the European Union and development of certain resources, mm -hmm. like even mm -hmm. heritage resources mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that uh, mm -hmm. connects. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. Just, uh, no, I think it, I think it could... politicians, you need uh, mm -hmm. more exact nature mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. certain resources. So mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I'm totally interested in looking at broader applications of that. 